Yo, what is up, everybody? Man, it's your boy JTM. And I'm the monster. And this is the debut of our new show, Live at Five. Bro down. Today, we have a special guest for you. None other than Bill's legend linebacker, Cornelius the Biscuit Bennett. Nine seven is going to be in the building answering questions. Woo! Man, I hope y'all excited because I am definitely excited, man. Like I said, Biscuit was definitely one of my players, one of my favorite players growing up. Uh, any stories on Biscuit Monster, man? Man, it just, every time I watch Biscuit, I refer to it as get wrecked. 9 7 was coming, or even 55 was coming through that line in the backfield. You was getting wrecked. It was get wrecked time for me. Every time I watched him, I loved it. All right, man. Like I said, man, we, um, me and Monster been talking. We decided to team up and do a show, man, because we feel like, man, we bring some great content. And, who better to bring you content than two titans? Alpha males. Like I said, we're going to keep this thing going all season, man. Like I said, this is just the beginning. But like I said, we got an interview with Bill's legend, Cornelius Benedict. This is huge. Like I said, we thank Cornelius for definitely taking time out of his day, and we cannot wait for him to call in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to talking to him. This, this, is, the, this is the premiere episode, and we got Cornelius Bennett for you. It's only going to go up from there, folks. It's only going to go up from there. Bigger and better things. For the live of five throwdown featuring JTM and Monster. That's it, man. That's it. Uh that man, Monster, what's what's going on, man? You know, we 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 out of OTAs now. We heading to camp. Man, man, I, I, put the pads on. Like I, I you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not I, I'm not enthused on anything. Like, like, you know what I mean? The, the Peterman stuff, Nate Peterman looks good. Easy. We're not there yet. They didn't even put their pads on yet. Give it some time, let it play out a little bit. But I'm definitely excited. I will be live uh, at training camp broadcasting at some point. I'll make sure details get out for that so we can get that to you guys. More content coming from JTM and the Monster. Just stay tuned, y'all. That's it, man. I mean, this is huge, man. Um, this is a huge offseason for Buffalo. This was such a huge offseason. There's a lot of competition. The competition, the quarterback position, there's competition at the receiver position. And I mean, not just competition for starters, competition for position spots. For jobs. And we haven't seen this type of competition for years. Good. Competition's going to drive it. Competition's going to drive it to be better on each position on our squad. It's going to be great to see how everything turns out. I'm excited to see about the receivers in the defense, man. I, I, like I said, I want, it, I want it to go right now. It's just the offseason, man, just, just shorten it up a little bit. Just shorten it up a little bit and just, you know what I mean? Eliminate the preseason. I don't care about the preseason. Eliminate the preseason. Give them two more weeks of training camp. That avoids all the injuries that ruin team seasons before the game, before the games even count. You know what I mean? I can't stand that. I watch four preseason games holding my breath because I don't want somebody to get injured in a game that's meaningless. Right. I mean, you can't help but think, like, when you see the headlines or breaking news every day during this time period. Yeah, man. What that, what's that ticker going to say? What team lost somebody? Because luckily, I think last year we escaped pretty much. Clear. Yeah, we, yeah, we had nicks and bruises, but we didn't have anybody huge come off. You know what I mean? We we skated through pretty health wise, and hopefully the gods will bless us with the same kind of health and good luck this year going into it. So here's the hope, my dude. That's it. So go speaking about the biscuit, right? Since he's coming on, our linebacking core. We have a monster in the middle in Tremaine Edmonds. He's running the show. They're gonna hand the keys of our defense to the rook, and I like it. They have confidence in him. And from what his teammates are saying, he's another alpha male. The kid's going to take the keys of the defense at his young age, and he's going to prosper. And he's going to learn from having to call those plays because he has to know where every single dude on that defense is going to be in order to call that. So the reads, the changes, the audibles that they're going to have to go through, it's all going to have to go through him. And for a young kid on our defense with the veterans we got to command that respect in order to run the defense, that says a lot about the kid's character to me. Right. So now the biggest thing about that is Preston Brown was young and he struggled with that. They actually actually turned who was it that the linebacker was it Manny Lawson that turned the calls over to for yeah. the rest of that season at yeah. his age and he struggled. I don't think we're gonna see that with Tremaine. For the simple fact that Tremaine's father played NFL, Will Farrell, or uh his name is Will. I think it's yeah. Will Will Edmonds. Um he has an older brother that's with the Saints, and we also know his twin his uh twin is with the uh Steelers. So he's coming from a football family. Yeah, that's pedigree. His pedigree. He's got it in his DNA. 
absolutely. To be the type of dude he is at his age and the physique he has and the just physical gifts that that kid has, and the ability to cover and go, man, he's just, whew, I can't wait to see him kick off, man. I just, I think the kid's just going to be a killer. He's just going to be a killer, and it's just going to do nothing but improve our defense and just, it's going to free stuff up. You know what I mean? Towards, you know, last year when we got rid of Marcel Darius, our penetration, and we just got ran all over because we couldn't get penetration because nobody on our line was worthy of a double team. So now you put star in there. You know what I mean? You still got right. uh, you still got nine five in there. You know what I mean? You rotate them out. Star's gonna draw that double team that allows those linebackers to sneak in. The pressure we weren't getting towards the end of last season once Marcel was gone, that pressure's gonna be there and it can come from all sides, especially from our secondary. Yeah, that's, that's gonna be huge. Um, like I said, Star Tully was a big signing. I mean, it was kind of tipped off. I mean, it was a good, hey, hey, uh, I think, hold on, monster. I think Biscuit is on the line. Cornelius. Yes. What is up, Biscuit, man? You're live with uh, JTM and uh, the Monster, man. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you guys for having me on. Man, I got to I gotta say, man, I saw your picture on Twitter Father's Day. You look like you're still in great shape. You still follow a regiment of some kind from when you played? No, I, I'm, I really don't, man. It's just genetics. Um, be honest with you, I'm down in the hot Florida sun and playing a little golf and uh really that's about it man I, i'm kind of allergic to going in the gym and stuff like that so um you know i've never been a big big eater or anything like that so it's um really it's just genetics man i'm very blessed man i share the same kind of same kind of thing <laughs> with the gym it's just kind of it's like kryptonite to me <laughs> I, yeah I try to stay away from it as much as possible and it works out i've I, I, I've you know i've accepted the dad body in my age <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tell you, you know, it's it's um, you know, like I said, it is genetic. But I, I, you know, I kind of watch what I watch what I eat. I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm not one of those people that will sit down and just um, gorge themselves on food or whatever. I just eat to eat to, you know, I'm satisfied kind of thing. Um, you know, I don't overeat. I eat a lot of protein. I, you know, I'm a protein guy. I'm, I like my snack is potato chips. So when I eat potato chips, I just Make sure the next day I don't eat, you know, eat any other carbs or anything like that. So, um, and it's, and it's worked out so far so good. You know, almost uh, what 19 years out of the game going, you know. So uh, yeah. I'm pretty cool with that. You still look like you could give it a go, man. Good job. Bro. No, good. that's just well, that's always good to look like that. But <laughs> but actually, <laughs> actually getting out there doing it is a whole nother story. I don't I don't have that mindset any longer. Uh, you know, that's 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 for my son to do right now. <laughs> Hey, speaking of your son, man, I saw you in some uh, nice yellow clothes, man. Well, that was orange, Tennessee orange. That was Tennessee orange, yeah. My son and I, well, our son, plays football at the University of Tennessee, and very proud dad, you know. um, That's the only way you can get me in those colors. Um, You know, it had to be some blood uh, (laughs) um, there playing, and um, I wear it proudly for him, you know. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You you, you mm-hmm. get a little bit of you put it on your back. You still feel like I love my boy, but this still doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> no, I mean you know as a parent, man, you know you you sacrifice so much for your children, man, and that's all. That's what it is—the sacrifice. It's like you know the sacrifice that I've made for him over the years, and um, I don't have a problem with it. I, I've I've only stated, yeah, I I, I um, told. Uh, the, the old head coach, Bush Jones, I said that was one thing um, after our, our son decided to commit to Tennessee, that was one thing that I wouldn't do, and that was to sing um, the Rocket Top song. And um, right. so far, I, I've yet to um, give in to that. Uh, but if they were to some kind of, kind of way win a national championship, who knows what I would do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Biscuit, with your son going to uh... – Tennessee, and I think it has listed as a uh, defensive tackle. Well, well defensive end, I um, mean, it was a tackle in the old defense. They switched up defenses now, so he's playing defensive end, yeah. What kind of things did you teach him from what you knew um, from your game as he grew and got mm. older? I, I wasn't a really a hands-on kind of, you know, coach or anything. I have something I, I, I really said I would never do because I never wanted to put in it unwanted pressure on him to uh, perform. Um, you know, I made him, you know, I helped make him so he's got the DNA and whether or not, you know, he could 
pull out what's inside of him. You know, that's that's a mental part of the game, and and I've always tried to prepare him mentally. I guess more than anything, the techniques and stuff. Um, I've left it up to the coaches, and so far they've done a tremendous job um, training him. And then when I do see certain things, um, I give him little signals or whatever from the, from the stands. He always has a way of finding me in the stands, and 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 I'll you know tell him if I see something, you know, make a little hand gesture or something to try to help him improve. Um, you know what he's doing on the field, but um, he's a pretty good student of the game, and um, his technique is pretty well. And you know he's still growing. He's a going into his sophomore year, um, so you know he has room to grow. And I feel like he's gonna, you know, he's gonna be a vital part for the team coming up this past. I mean, this uh, next season. I'm really looking forward to his sophomore um, campaign. Absolutely, and we will follow his career here with us because, man, mm-hmm. if he's anything like his father. He's gonna be a treat to watch. Well, I, I hope he's. I hope he's better. You know, you you want him to do better and be better, and that's what I hope. Um, again, you know, he has the tools. Just whether or not you know his desire is there, um, produce, and um, you know, only time will tell, man. Um, he had a good spring game. I, I was very pleased with his spring game. Um, Started out kind of rough during the warm-ups. I, you know, his head coach said, I'm not, I guess it was more anything because I pay attention. It was kind of in his face firing him up, I would assume, more than anything. Uh, didn't like the way he was warming up. And but once the, um, you know, the, the kickoff happened or whatever and the game started, um, you know, he showed some bright spots. Um, he finished up the spring game. I thought uh, probably one of the better defensive performances uh, of the spring. Right. Now you also have a daughter that's playing uh in dad's colors at Alabama. No, uh, uh, she no longer she no longer plays volleyball. Uh, she's back home with us. She decided that she had had enough of volleyball, um, so she's just here working and um, trying to finish up school. Man, you know she just I guess you know travel volleyball. I'm telling you that's man I, I, <laughs> as a dad as a you know an athlete and as a dad. That was brutal. You know, you have school volleyball, then you have travel volleyball, which is more brutal than the high school volleyball. And and I have talked to parents over the years, uh, um, you know, watching her travel around or whatever, and, and they was like, you know, hopefully she doesn't burn out, you know, because she's so talented. And and that was the only thing that can happen, that, you know, outside of a serious, serious injury, which was happening a lot in girls and, vo- and volleyball and sports in general, you know, especially ACLs or whatever. For some reason, girls – um have a lot of ACL injuries, so I, you know we was very fortunate with that that she didn't suffer um, a significant injury playing travel volleyball. But the burnout part happened, and um, it's too sad because I thought she was really special playing volleyball. Um, she was a <clears throat> excuse me right side left handed hitter, which is which is very unique in itself, and and she was such a tremendous athlete on the volleyball court um, that I thought you know the possibilities for her to play until she was tired of playing volleyball was endless and it happened too soon that she grew tired of it. Well, maybe the path will lead her back someday. You never know. Yeah. Well, she's still young and still has some eligibility left. And I'm hoping that the fire, you know, reignite in or something, you know, before it gets too late. Um, and, um, she, you know, give it another go because I, I don't really think she really, you know, quit playing on her own terms, which which right. happens in professional, you know, which happens in sports right. in general, not just professional sports, but in sports in general. Um, you know, everybody wants to try to leave on their own terms, and hopefully she can come to grips with whatever made her tired of playing and figure it out and maybe give it one more chance and, um, you know, do it, you know, finish up the way she really wants to finish up. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you were recruited by the legend Bear Bryant. You were a first-team, three-time All-American. Now, second-team. First team, three time All American. Were you kind of disappointed when you got there that you didn't get the mentorship or the chance to play underneath Bear because he had left by the time you got there? Um, it never really bothered me. Um, I was just so elated that I was being recruited by Coach Bryant. Not many kids can say that. And um, not many kids can say that, um, you know, Coach Bryant came to the house and sat and met, you know, and talked and fell asleep at their house with their parents and that kind of thing. <laughs> so I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate um, in that aspect. But, you know, he was very frail when he was recruiting his last year, which was my class. And um, there had been rumors going around that he quite possibly, maybe the next season, my, which would have been my freshman year, 
would have been his last year coaching anyway. So I, I kind of understood that. But, you know, growing up in Birmingham, it was either an Auburn fan or Alabama fan, and I just happened to grow up being an Alabama fan. And so it really didn't matter uh, in a sense, but I would have loved to play for him. But um, I have my Coach Bryant stories just like any other guy that played for him. You know, I was recruited by him and had a chance to meet him and sit in his office and and share some of the same stories that some of his former players share. That's awesome. I'm sure as he looks back on his last recruiting class, he can put a star that he was the one that recruited Cornelius Bennett. Well, I, I, I say that myself, and that's why I always <laughs> bring it up, that I was recruited by Coach Bryant, so as it is true. And and nobody knew um, the outcome of, you know, my playing at the university because I went there and had no idea that I was going to be a linebacker, first of all. Um, you know, it was – Kind of talked about, but it was mostly, you know, either tight end or running back. Was you tight thought end you were being, tight end, huh? Yeah, I was, I was, I was pretty good um, offensive player. I had pretty good running back. I made all America my senior year in high school at running back, and um, I wasn't bad. I just thought I was better suited as far as my size was concerned. That was new. That wasn't any six foot three running backs outside of Eric Dickerson, which I don't think is truly six foot three. But you know, I was six three and. Two were right about 220 coming out of high school, and I just didn't really see myself playing running back in, in college football, let alone if I had made it to the NFL, you know, thinking, you know, trying to think forward back then. And I thought tight end was a position that, um, because that was my original tight end when I went in high school, and, and I played, and I, was, I thought I was pretty good at running routes and catching the ball, and especially with the speed. I mean, you know, I look back on, on, on playing high school ball and look at the tight ends, the size of these guys today, I think I would have been that prototype kind of tight end back in the day. Oh, absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. what, what's See interesting it? about that is when you came out, you know, you were that, that new style linebacker, the athletic guy who could honestly play both sides of the ball. But now you look mm-hmm. around at the field now, do you see what you were then all across the field now on defense? And maybe you set a trend? Yeah. Not really. You don't you don't see the you know, the Lawrence Taylors and the Derek Thomases and the Junior Seals and, you know, people like myself and it's, to me, you know, that could play multiple positions and um rush the passer, be good against the run, be good against the pass. You know, guys are kinda of one dimensional and I think that's just the way they're training. Um, not to say that that's not that kind of um, um, those kind of athletes that are out there. I just I just think it's the way that they're training. You know, they're just training them one dimensional. Um, even 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 playing multiple sports growing up, I don't think you you know I think um, uh, our ability to to be so versatile um, came from us playing multiple sports growing up. And and you know, coaches now because football is just such a big business that they try to de- deter kids from playing multiple sports. And and we fought against it and. And I just wouldn't, you know, we would never give in to it. I was like, you know, if he wants to, if he wants to roll or whatever he decides to do, you know, and give him the chance to do it as long as his grades are good. And and um, so, you know, my son, you know, played basketball, played baseball for a year, you know, didn't really like it, but you know, the opportunity was there for him to play. And and I and and I had always said the day that a coach tells my son that he should only play football, um, that that'll be the last day that he plays for the coach. Good so, man. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, that's one thing. But I just think you just pigeonhole kids when, when you just make them one-dimensional. You know, football is it's still a game of fun. And, and that's time, you know, when you get to college or you get to the pros that you, you know, that you stick to one position. But high school, man, I, I, I in my career in high school, I quarterback, I punted, I kicked. I was running back. I was wide out. I was a tight end, defensive end, linebacker, you know, cornerback, wherever they needed me to play, you know, and that's what I did. And and I enjoyed it. I never once complained about it, even when I got to college and they said, hey, we're going to make you a linebacker. And it's like, okay, uh, because I thought they knew better at that time, you know, like I said, going into college, um, that's that's them, in, you know, evaluating me and, and deciding linebacker was probably going to be the best position for me. And then, you know, if that didn't work out, then we would try running back a tight end. And, and that's that's how it was. And I just think that's that's how it should be with kids because, you know, I think most of us coming out of high school are just great, you know, athletes. Uh, how You know, you see how they list kids as athletes. Um, I, I thought that would have, for me, that would have suited me. Um, defining me greatly. And they just said, you know, Cornelius Bennett, athlete, um, right. instead of running back, tight end, linebacker, whatever, because I didn't know which position. Coach Perkins and I, who was my head coach at Alabama, we we met the 
before we started fall practice my freshman year, and and it could have been a you know a, a little white lie that he was telling me, but it was confidence because what he told me was uh, we would try linebacker for a few days and see how that goes, and then uh, then you know running back a tight end if if the linebacker thing wasn't you know you wasn't conf- if I wasn't comfortable enough being that you know linebacker we would try, but after the first. I think after the first practice or whatever, I was, you know, I felt, oh man, this is it. You know, I get a chance to 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 be versatile on defense and not just, you know, be a run stopper or whatever. They gave me a chance to rush the pass or drop in the coverage, play against the run. And and after the first practice, I can remember him asking me as we were walking off the field, what did I think? And I just, I gave him a hand wave like, you know, just okay, we're good. Leave me at linebacker, and the rest is history. Yeah, it worked out pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it worked yeah. out pretty good. I think I think I think my career I think my career was elongated by, by just playing linebacker. To be honest with you, I don't think if I'd have played you know, on the offensive side of the ball, I don't think I would have had such a long um, career in the NFL. That's real talk right there. That's real talk. Mm-hmm. Now, now when you got to Buffalo, how much did your first defensive coordinator Walt Corey and Daryl Talley help you get adjusted? Because you had a little bit of catch up time when you first got here to Buffalo. How Adam, well, how instrumental were they to helping you get to where you got? And then once you got to that point, you just it was over with. You just excelled well, and you had it. Well, well, Walt was, you know, it was it was what I needed, especially at the particular time, you know, coming in in the middle of the season. Um, the defense wasn't a lot of terminology, it's very basic, but it was a good defense, and he was the perfect coach for me, who who didn't do a lot of. Um, chalkboard talking, you know, um, you know, it, it was very simple. Gave me a chance to uh, be successful right away. But then Daryl, then I had a chance to to be with Daryl, who was who was just like a coach himself, you know. And Daryl was like, um, put the playbook aside. I'll teach you everything you need to know on the fly. And that's how I learned how to play football in the NFL. Was really through Daryl. Um, coaching me on the field, which was a tremendous asset, um, and you can ask any young player when when you get a vet that's willing to to be a mentor and not afraid that you're gonna steal the you know the, the spotlight from them, man. That's the best thing in the world happened to you. And um, so I always compliment Daryl on being to me. I've always said I don't know why in the world Daryl wouldn't what didn't coach, but then when I look at it, when I really take a deep look at it. Kind of do. I, I know why he never got a chance to coach because I think Daryl knew more than most coaches, and I think coaches, defensive coordinators would have been, uh, uh, um, you know, I wouldn't say ashamed, but you know, kind of put put back by him being a coach, knowing more than they would, and 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 just just wouldn't want to have him on his coaching staff. And that happens a lot with former players. That's why you don't see the number of former players that should be coaching coach because. A lot of the coordinators, a lot of the coaches never played at the level that we played at. And, uh, um, you know, and, 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 and I'm afraid that guys would know more than they would. You know, I've seen it happen in meetings, man. You know, I've seen coaches get embarrassed by, by former players. Oh, that's real right there. Speaking of that, you know, it's funny that you said that because, like we said, we saw another great that played in your time, Mike Singletary. Who, it mm-hmm. took him a long time to get a job that he deserved. A long Definitely. time. And, and I would I would guarantee that that had to be part of the reason, you know, the intimidation factor, and the fact that he probably well not probably that he knew more football than 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 the coaches that were were trying to coach him, or that he probably would have been you know had a chance to work for. Right. Now speaking of the durability, like I said, you it's out of your whole career, you only not started two games mm-hmm. out of your entire career. Yeah, that was my first game, and then um, I think I was injured. Um, uh, I think I was injured one game in my first game, and I think I was injured one game. Uh, uh, maybe it just was the circumstances of the offense or something. I don't know what the second game was, but that's that's my thinking. I don't, you know, I never kept up with that stuff, man. I just enjoyed putting on the blues or the blacks or the or the blue and white when I played with the coach on, uh, coach on Sunday. I never kept up with that stuff, man. I just I wanted to be there for my teammates and play on Sundays, and that's that's all I cared about. Man, you showed up. <laughs> well, that's 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 part. I, I showed up, and 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 I like to guess as the young people say, I showed up and showed out, kind of thing. Um, you know, showing up is 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 just half of it. You know, being there and performing is the other part of it. And I always felt like I was always prepared to perform at the highest level on Sundays. All right. Speaking of showing up, 
question to ask you. Back in the heyday mm-hmm. of the field Super Bowl era, who had the better barber, you or Leonard Smith? Because you both had clean lines. Who was better? Well, Leonard, our, our, our styles were different, but we actually we went to the same barber shop. Uh, oh. Most of most of most of the brothers, we would race out on Friday evenings, uh, heading into the city, going to uh, um, to the barber shop. You know, line up. You go in the barber shop. It's just like it would be a team meeting, but. Um, I, I would, you know, I, you know, Leonard went with the designs as far as the bills and all that stuff. I just, I would just do, you know, simple stuff, um, kind of like what you're saying today as far as designs are concerned, um, you know. But I always just kept it neat and tight around the sides and with a little bit on the top, something that I wish I could still do to this day. But <laughs> Mother Nature, she decided, yeah, Mother Nature, she decided otherwise. So <laughs> me, me and you both, me and you both, I'm following the challenge as well. Yeah, yeah, but it is what it is, man. And uh, hey, hey I, I, I've embraced it, and I take a lot of hair. So my fucking yeah. is okay because my hair is gone. Right, yeah. I haven't been to a barber shop since about 1996 or seven, somewhere around that, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was spending about. Oh man, I was spending probably back in the day about twenty bucks a week to you know for a cut. So now today that'd probably be you know double that. I don't know what they charge in the shop because I haven't been there so long. It's crazy. <laughs> crazy. Uh, <laughs> speaking of mentoring and Daryl Talley helped you. We just did a uh, a interview with your former teammate Jeff Burris not too long ago, and he mentioned you mm-hmm. as a mentor for him. Mhm. And how you really wow. helped him along. Yeah, well, I, again, you know, I, I was so fortunate with, you know, having Daryl and, and Bruce and the other guys uh, there for me. And it was just, and that was natural for me to be a leader. That was something when I was at the university, I I, I was thrust into a leadership role as a true freshman, as a, you know, 18-year-old freshman at University of Alabama, uh, um, leading older guys. You know, that was something I was very comfortable doing, and, and um, I always thought, um, you know, when I saw a need to say something to younger guys, and I did it throughout my career, um, and and Jeff was just one of those, oh, until this day, he's still one of the best people in the world. And I was fortunate enough to have a chance to play with him twice, you know, Buffalo and, and finish up my career with him in Indianapolis. And what a, what a special person. And, and, again, one of those great smart kids, um, no football through and through, and, you know, and now he's, you know, he's been an NFL coach and he's been in college, high school, whatever. And again, given the opportunity, I think he would make a tremendous head coach because his personality, character, all that stuff, you know, what you look for, um, you know, he's the epitome of it. And, and um, again, he just, they make former players just jump through the hoops of, of trying to be the coach, you know, that they can be or should be or want to be just given an opportunity for some reason. I don't know how and why athletic directors or executives on the NFL level can't understand that, you know, uh, um, you know, players, I mean, we, we, we know every side of the game on the field, off the field. And, and those special people that are able to, to do it should, you know, should be given an opportunity, but for some reason they like to keep it separate. And it's just, um, it's a hard business. And that's why I never even thought about it going into the business it was just something i just decided that, that i just didn't want to have a part of because of the politics that's involved in it right and it's a testament to who you are as a man and your character that you took knowledge that was bestowed upon you by greats and you passed it forward man that's 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 what's up man yeah i mean you know the, all the young linebackers that was in the room all those guys man we marlo perry david white all those guys man and you know um I, I think, you know, I, I left a mark on them just like Daryl left a mark on me. And I'm assuming, you know, throughout their careers, um, you know, try to give them the same uh, information to pass the knowledge on to others. And that's how football is. You know, you it's a brotherhood. It's a true brotherhood. And that's the one thing you asked me about my son earlier. That's the one thing that I've always tried to instill in him as team, you know, teammate, being a teammate. That, that's, a, that's a big, big uh, um, challenge for a lot of kids because a lot of kids are, come from these situations where, you know, relying on another person, it's it's hard, especially in the city kids. You know, they have to rely on themselves to get out of the hood or whatever and, and building up that chemistry in the locker room, trusting another man is hard. And, and, and so trying to instill that in him, dude, you want more success on the field? You guys become teammates, you know, make this a real team. 
not just, you know, you playing for the University of Tennessee. Y'all become teammates. And, and one of the things that um, I hear him say so much of now is, is the camaraderie part of, you know, that teammate part. Get to, know your, get to know your teammate, not just the guys that sit next to you on your left and the right in the locker room. Get to know everybody in the teammate, you know, in the locker room a little bit about each person. You go back to the movie that Denzel Washington from the school in, in, um, in Maryland, that movie when he was, did the team building. That's 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 really how football is, you know, and a good coach would do that. You would have team building exercise, and I think you know, when when you're a struggling team and 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 you can trust each other and those to- close tight games, and you look across the line and you see your teammates, or you look across the hood and you see your teammates' eyes, and and it's all for one, one for all. You win those close games, you and that's what, it. yeah, and that's and that's what I think happened with Buffalo last year. Building, you know, coach come in and not saying these other coaches run those kind of coaches because I don't know. I haven't been around up then forever. But meeting with coach last year, sitting and talking to him, picking brains of, of some of the greats that played the game in Buffalo and hearing his ideas or whatever, I guarantee you a lot of it is team building, being able to trust your teammates. And that's what it's all about. And that's why Buffalo was back in the playoffs along with having talented players because you don't play at that level if you're not talented. I don't care if the stats don't say so, but you don't make it on a 53-man roster and not be talented. From the man's mouth himself. You know, speaking of the team-building thing, I think another problem with the team-building thing nowadays is the money. It's so much money out there now and the holdouts and different things that's happened that didn't necessarily happen back in the day that way. It's that Mm -hmm. someone's always ripping. There's always somebody looking for more and someone that was feeling left out. So maybe that's the problem with the team building nowadays, that it's always something else going on and you're losing focus. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that because the money is always when you, when you think about what general public is making. So, that, I, you know, you can say that was, that's, that's forever, that the money is going to be there. I think it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's just, again, trusting another man, it's, it's hard. It's trusting anybody is hard, but get in that locker room, and then it's it's how you you know how you're made as well. And if you're not put in a good situation to be able to handle those kind of situations, I don't care if you're making six dollars or six million dollars. You know, it's it's the person. And and if you don't have anybody coaching you along, you know that's the one thing about athletes. You know, we're very coachable kids, and the ones that are not kind of fall by the wayside. You know, they kind of weed themselves out. But um, you know, you could say the the publicity part of it probably plays a part in it. And what I mean by that is, you know, most of these guys coming in the league now, they have their own uh, publicists. And, and then I think, um, you know, you know that everybody wants to off the field accolades, um, the, the big money off the field, you know, the being in the public eye kind of thing. We didn't have to worry so much about that. Then, you know, there was no social media. You know, we weren't being – um, you know, you hardly recognize a lot of guys without their helmets being, uh, uh, you know, when their helmets fall kind of thing. Now, you know, the, the, the league and the Players Association have done a tremendous job of, of letting people see the faces of the guys that are playing on Sundays. And, and that's that's been a, tremendous for a lot of guys, but some guys can handle it, some can't, as far as the, you know, the, the notoriety part of it. And so sometimes if, if you're not put in your place as far as um, being a teammate and not an individual on a team sport, um, it can get in the way. And I think, you know, again, it goes back to having a great coach who who, who believes in team building and and who won't let those outside influences influence the bigger picture for the whole team. And I think that's the biggest problem, not the money. It's just um, the outside influences away from the game. Um, guys starting to feel like, you know, they are the man, you know, they're the man and, and the team ain't going to be no, you know, team won't be any good without them. You know, if they don't play, play well, the team's not going to play well. That's not how it is. It's, it's all about when your brother's struggling, you pick up the slack kind of thing, and, and I don't think um, guys believe in it. And, you know, I, I, I know for a fact from, from talking, and I won't call names from, from past Buffalo teams um, over the recent years or whatever, that's a couple of guys in the locker room that just – it was about me, about me, about me. And that's every team in the league, I guarantee you. It's always, a, you know, one or two guys. But I'm talking Buffalo because, I, you know, we're talking about Buffalo or whatever, and – and and that and that becomes a, a festering sore, you know. It just you know you start losing, and that person becomes you know he just 
becomes more and more of a problem. And then it rubs off. And then you got two guys. Then you got three guys. Then now guys are just ready to pack up and can't wait for the season to be over, kind of thing, whatever. So uh, you have to kind of, you have to nip that in the bud right away. And otherwise, you know, if you can't, then you get rid of them. You know, it's as simple as that. Trade them, cut them, whatever. If they don't want to conform to to the team concept, then you you know you you rid yourself. I'm coach coach uh, coach Levy. Uh, I can remember him saying in a speech one time about you know the character guys and that you know give me some high quality character guys and um, you know over over guys with a ton of accolades you know football accolades in a day of the week you know he said he wants to cut a Heisman Trophy winner you know and that, and that was due to you know his behavior or whatever and not want to conform to the team concept and yeah. and I think that's a big part of it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, mm-hmm. it's all about them building their own brands nowadays. And- yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big part of that. And that's all sports. Um, yeah. But some guys some guys can do it. Some guys can do it. And and, 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 and it doesn't bother the team part of it. You see what right. I'm saying? Some guys, some, guys are, uh, some guys can handle it, and, and some guys can't. So let me ask you this, Biscuit. All right, who is the one man that you played against? One man that you played against that to this day you hold the utmost respect for as a competitor to play against, and who was the one man that you played against that got you into the red? Like I need nine sacks today against this dude. I'm just gonna go get it. Who are those two guys? For you? Um, I, I guarantee anybody from our era that played against um, and I, ten out of ten guys you interview that played against Barry Sanders would say Barry Sanders is the guy that you know you made sure that you had your shoes tied up tight and had enough Gatorade and, you know, pref- you know, prepared yourself more during the week for it kind of thing, whatever. But quarterbacks, um, I hated all of them, you know, from a football perspective, not as people, but that's, you know, and that's how I looked at all offensive guys, man. You know, son, it's that gladiator part of you. Hey, you know, you know, your friends afterwards, and you, you would meet up with guys in the tunnels after and shake hands, and because you know most guys from college ball anyway, right? Uh, you see them in off season, whatever, and, and it was just everybody knew once the, the the first whistle blew to the last, it was competition, and so you get wrecked. Yeah, yeah, it was it was that <laughs> mentality, man, and 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 after the game was over, you walk meet up in the middle of the field and. Dap it up and, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you know, see each other afterwards, kind of thing. But yeah, I hated, all, I hated all of them, man. <laughs> so let me ask you this: it's game day, five minutes before kickoff, ninety-seven sitting at his locker. You got headphones on. What music's getting you to that level? What are you listening to? Or did you have one radio I'm, in the locker room that nobody was allowed to touch, and that's what you listen to? <laughs> no, uh, um. When I first started playing, um, you know, I, I I wasn't into it, but I guess the older I got, you know, I'm still sitting around for so long. Um, because when you first get, you know, you're anxious, you're ready to go. So, but now I think, um, towards the later part of my career, I started listening. To, I'm a big blues guy, big blues guy. So, um, love blues. So it would probably have been some blues, and I'm trying to probably in my last year, um. CD I had in the, in the CD player because it was still CD back when I finished up. <laughs> Probably was um, uh, either Muddy Waters or somebody like that. You know, Albert King, BB King, Muddy Waters, or somebody like that. Man, that I that I really that I was really digging. Until this day, that's uh, Albert Albert King. I listen to Albert King almost on a daily basis uh, when I'm you know doing something around the house. But I love blues. My daddy was a blues guy, and I grew up, you know, listening to a lot of old blues, and and that's what I like, and that's what I was listening to when I was finishing up. Outstanding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Outstanding, man. Hey, speaking of Marv Levy, now, do you see some uh, some uh, similarities? Because you said the word character, high character, and when the day Sean McDermott walked into the door in Buffalo, his thing was about character. Do you see some similarities there between the two? No doubt about it. Um, I, I, you know, from I, I don't sit in meetings with with them or um, watch a lot of him on the sidelines or whatever. But he seems to have the same kind of demeanor as Coach Lever. Very calm, you know. Uh, um, uses his smarts to get his point across. You know, instead of the yelling, screaming, cursing kind of coach or whatever, which is which to me is the best kind of coach. Um, I I I responded better to to that kind of coach. Um, I'm so grateful that I never had a coach who was in my ear yelling and screaming or whatever. But 
Um, he definitely had some of the same character uh, um, qualities as Coach Levy. Um, and, and getting guys to perform, I mean, he proved that this past year. Um, you come in and you have a team that's, I won't say ragtag, but, you know, a team that had struggled for the last couple of <laughs> few years or whatever, excuse me, in the last few years and, and get them to come together and, and make the playoffs for the first time in 17 years. Um, so um, he definitely has that it factor when it comes to coaching because, you you, you know, you're dealing with um, – they're dealing with a new coach coming in, guys that have been there uh, for, for many years, have had two or three head coaches, and, then, and and I'm sure some of them in the back of their mind is like, oh, here we go again, a new coach, new you know, new coach here, new coach there kind of thing, whatever. But he was able to come in in a very short period of time and get those guys to buy into the system. And that's what it's about. That's what a good head coach does. He manages what he has. You know, he manages the guys, and the guys buy into it. And it's just like in any corporate situation. You got a great CEO, um, pretty much your company, you you know, and you got great uh, uh, people under you, advisors or what have up under you, then the regular employees, they're going to they're gonna perform well. You know, and, and that's what it's about, managing managing the people that you have working for you. And, and he did a tremendous job. I just I knew last April when we met with him that it was it was it was going to be a big change happening. I, I you know just sitting and and I had a chance to sit um, to his left. So I was next to him and I had a chance to talk to him probably more than than than, than any other guy sitting at the table. Uh, you know, um, and and just every time we every time a question you know, I asked a question, I could see the sincerity in him and, and, and desire to want to be good and want to change the culture uh, because he understood the history of Buffalo Bills from, you know, how we built the team up and how we built, you know, the town up as far as the fans. And, and, and he was itching to be a part of that, you know, rebuilding process. And, and um, um, I thought this, this draft was a tremendous draft for him. And, you know, I'm just looking forward to, to uh, seeing what happens for him. Now speaking of the draft, mm -hmm. the Bills like you played with Jim Kelly, and now we select Josh Allen, who's supposed to be our franchise quarterback going forward. But we also get a linebacker that's often compared to you, and you're the Tremaine Edmonds. Mm -hmm. What do you think of those two players? Well, you know the quarterback, I really couldn't tell you much about, but um, the Edmonds, you know, I played against his father, Farrell, great tight end in our era, big guy. Um, very athletic, and I've watched some of his kids play a couple of years, not this year, not this past year, but two years ago I had a chance to watch his sons play. And I was like, wow, these kids, you know, they really have it. And I forgot that they were draft eligible this year. And, man, you know, um, what a great move. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, 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 the lineage is there. I'm sure he's been groomed well to, to, to know how to act, as a, you know, act like a pro. Uh, but, you know, the playing on Sundays is a different part. You know, a lot of guys can't transition from college to pro football, but I, I think this kid is going to be special now. You know, um, putting a putting a tag on him already, I don't, you know, I'm not I'm not big into that, and whether it be me or anybody else comparing him to, I just I want him, you know, to be good for the sake of the team. Um, I think and that, that'll be his problem, his answer. He want to be good for the sake of the team and, and not being compared to anybody. He want to make his own mark. Uh, but um, but I, I you know I'm excited to see um, you know I, I you need impact players on defense you, you need impact players and if he's an impact player um, you know I, I think it makes the offense work so much better when when they know they have the confidence in their defense if they do make a mistake that the defense can go back out there and make things happen and get the ball back to the offense um, so if he's you know if he's an impact player then um, you know, then I, I'm looking for the team to be a you know good team because secondary wise, um, it's you know, I think one of the top three or four secondaries in the league um, already, and, and now you you add some impact players up front, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be exciting to watch. I'm I'm excited for the team. I'm excited for the city. Good. We're excited here too. Absolutely, we're excited. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. If he turns out to be anything, you know what I mean, like like. Like right. yourself or like Daryl, it's like man, that's that's nothing but a blessing to us. And he's got champion yeah, pedigree, just like the Bennett family. Definitely. He's got the DNA yeah. and the bloodlines. Yeah, I, I am. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited, man. Um, it's gonna, you know, seeing him in that number forties jersey <laughs> at linebacker though. That's I'm some well, probably like people seeing me in '97, so I don't know. But 
You know, but again, that's a that's a way to stick out. You know, stick out like a sore thumb. You know, but being able to produce not just because you got an awkward football number on, but being able to stick out. You know, from from your you know that that just gives them a, a, a something else to to have people to take notice of. You know, look at who's this guy number. You know, <laughs> I, I'm 40, so I'm with you. It took me long, like the receivers wearing single digits and just yeah, the number change. Yeah. It took me a while. I didn't like it at first. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but you know, I mean, that's that's the individual part. That's a little bit of individuality part of the game. That's you know, um, getting away. You know, the, the you know the the NFL has got so many rules and regulations or whatever. So that little part of the individuality part of it. That's you know, that's that's okay. That's cool. But what you do in the number, that's what you do. <laughs> you know, that's what you do. Yeah, that makes the number popular or make it stand out or whatever. So I, I'm sure he, I'm sure he'll be fine. Exactly, I'm sure he'll be fine. Yeah, he, he, he. Um, you know, they wouldn't have selected him that high if they didn't think um, he was the guy for the job. Well, Biscuit, we don't want to take too much more of your time, man. We thank you for joining us today, man. Uh, really appreciate it. Well, thank you guys for having me on, man. It's um, always good to to um, talk to people back up in Buffalo, and um, and I'm always looking forward to to coming back and. You know, seeing what transpired there, man. I'm I'm excited for the upcoming season, so I hope you guys are as well. Man, it was a pleasure to have you here. I just want to say, as a Bills fan, watching you do your thing over your career, you've created a lot of great football memories for me personally. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for that. And hopefully in the future, maybe midseason, we can touch base with you and recap what's going on so far. All right. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Thank you, Cornelius. Thank you. All right. Mm, bye-bye. All right, everybody, that was Bill's legend, great uh, Cornelius Bennett. Um, we definitely thank him for taking the time to join us. And Monster, any recap on what he said, man? Man, just from his, from, from his mouth to your ears, man, that's the biscuit. Yeah, you know what I mean? He, he, he dropped knowledge. You know what I mean? A lot of personal stuff, a lot of things, you know what I mean? The answers were genuine, man. It just a great interview, man. Good cat. You know what I mean? He has his head on his shoulders. I like what he said about his kids and everything. And, you know, it's just, I, I like to hear that, man. It was it was great talking to him. Yeah, it was great, man. He Jeff, definitely dropped some bombs on him, especially about the coaching. Because, like I said, I know there's always those players that we watched growing up. We'd be like, man, why isn't this player co- coaching? Why isn't this player right. coaching? And I think that provided the perspective that we needed from someone that's inside the trenches. Explains it. He gives a perspective that none of us have. He knows. Right. So, man. It, was, so it was nice to kind of get him in there and, you know what I mean? Get him to drop what he dropped, man. It was, it was a good talk, man. I really enjoyed Definitely. it. Definitely. Hey, man, but like I said, we're going to ready to get off this thing, man. We thank you all for joining us. Like I said, I'm JTM. I'm the monster. And this was the 5 o'clock throwdown. We're going to be bringing it to you every single week. So tune in. And we'll see you there. I'll see you guys in an hour and a half for the get up. Man, get I'm up. Gonna down here all day. I got to go write a show still. And I'm running out of time. Just busy, busy, busy. But I'm doing it for you guys, bringing you great content. Much love. Thank you, everybody, for watching and tuning in. Thank you, Cornelius Bennett. Of course, thank JTM. He's a class act. Love the guy. That's it. All right, Monster. I will catch you same time, same place next week. Let's do it. We out. Out here.